Early Christian writers, also known as Church Fathers, including Papias, Jerome, Justin Martyr and Eusebius, attribute Mark's Gospel to John Mark, companion of the disciple Peter. And this is the position on authorship taken by Christian apologists, though by few secular scholars. This authorship position also comes with a date of writing. No early Christians give us the date of writing exactly, but if their evidence is taken as reliable, then it can be inferred from the sequence of events that they recount that Mark was probably written in the early 40s AD, when John Mark, Peter's companion, was pressured into writing it by Christians in Rome, and he completed this task in Rome or in Italy and Rome. Apologists do find some support for this theory in the theology expressed in Mark, which is distinctly pre-Pauline, in that Jesus is not a god, he has minimal supernatural power, and has no saving utility or role in vicarious atonement, all of which ideas come from Paul, who was writing from the late 40s to the late 50s. This is true, but it is also true that Paul shows absolutely no awareness of Mark, so one being unaware of the other doesn't really help tell which came first. Apologists complain that the origin of the Gospel of Mark is better attested to by more witnesses who were closer in time to the writing of the Gospel than almost any other ancient literature, and yet scholars willingly accept these other reports but reject reports about the New Testament in general and Mark in particular. Which is true, they do, and here's why. Secular scholars find several objections to the Church Fathers' scheme. First, Church Fathers were not independent witnesses. Some cite Papias as their source for the origin of Mark, and those who don't probably got the story indirectly from him. It is argued by apologists that the Church Fathers were widely scattered around the Roman Empire, and they infer from this that they were independent sources. But that seems unlikely, as they could and did cite each other's work, and corresponded with their contemporaries. The second objection to the Church Fathers' scheme is that Papias appears to have been talking about Gospels other than the ones that we know, and his comments were erroneously associated with our Gospels by later ancient Christians. In the case of Mark, these objections are not quite as strong as they are in the case of Matthew. As we saw in my video on the authorship of Mark, one of the reasons for rejecting Papias is that he tells us that the Matthew he's familiar with was written in Hebrew, whereas we know that our Matthew was written in Greek, a positive inconsistency. But in the case of Mark, there is no such positive inconsistency. Rather, there are the more subjective assertions by Papias that Mark was written out of order. And his choice of words that suggest that his Mark was a list of sayings rather than a narrative gospel as the Mark we know is. Well, Mark does contain some of the sayings of Jesus, and the out of order thing could date back to a competing, now lost, chronology. So the ancient Christian's dating of Mark may be suspect, but it does not collapse in the way that it does for Matthew. A third objection to the Church Fathers is that they were generally unreliable witnesses, following an evangelical agenda of proselytisation rather than recording reliable history. The upshot of all this is that there is an all-or-nothing effect with the Church Fathers. Scholars either accept or reject their evidence en bloc without much eclectic selection between the two extremes. Accept them and Mark was written by John Mark, friend of the disciple Peter, in the early 40s AD. Reject them, and we don't know when it was written or who wrote it. In the latter case, other clues to dating are available. In simple terms, Mark must have been written after the dates of events or the commencement of reigns that it cites, and it must have been written before the first time it was cited unambiguously. John the Baptist is mentioned by Josephus, and from what he says we can determine that John was executed before the mid-30s AD an event that Mark's aware of. Mark is also aware that Pontius Pilate was the prefect of Judea, a post assumed in 26 AD, and Herod Antipas, also known to Mark, reigned from 4 BC. So together, Mark must have been written no earlier than the early 30s, and no later than when it was first cited, which was in about 180 AD. A pretty wide range. There are a couple of passages in Mark 13 that inform dating, and one of these concerns this generation. Whether or not Jesus existed, the writer of Mark placed his life in the first third of the first century AD. The writer also recounts that Jesus said that this generation will not pass, 
before he returned to Earth to set up his kingdom. Now, about 80 generations have passed since then, and there is no sign of his return yet, and this has led Christians to rationalise what Mark meant. But to secular scholars, it certainly appears that the intention at the time was to communicate the idea of an early return. And the relevance to dating is that you wouldn't expect the author to say this if writing at a time when the generation that heard Jesus had passed or was rapidly passing. If that argument is accepted, it puts a limit on the time of writing. At the extreme, this would be about 90 AD, as the date when there would be almost nobody alive whose adult lifespan overlapped that of Jesus. But that would be pushing it, because towards 90 AD, the credibility of the prophecy would be low and its expiry date imminent. For the right combination of durability and impact, we would expect a substantial proportion of people who listened to Jesus as adults were still alive when Mark was written. The argument neatly lines up with the 40s AD and is starting to become rather strained by the late 60s and 70s, where Mark is more conventionally dated. But it's still feasible at these dates. This brings me to the second passage and the most important one for dating Mark. Mark 13 tells us what Jesus said about the coming war and the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Here are the relevant bits, starting at verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them, and the gospel must be first preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child, Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetops go down to enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress, unequalled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equalled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. The next few verses aren't so relevant to dating. Then verse 30 Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So, Jesus is predicting the destruction of the temple, and the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried it, but predicting the future is really hard. The march of time is a harsh critic of would-be prophets, But retrospective prophecy, which means writing stories about people who predicted things that have already occurred, well, that's easy. So Mark's accurate prediction of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem leads many scholars to believe that it was written after the temple was destroyed. And in order to minimise the strain on the argument from this generation, the dating usually ends up being around 70 or shortly thereafter. Well, while it may be difficult to predict the future... It's not impossible to get lucky, and there are some things about Mark's prediction that suggest that perhaps he didn't know what had happened and he did get lucky. 
We know what happened because Josephus tells us, and he says that the temple and surrounding area of Jerusalem were destroyed by a sustained and destructive fire. Fires lead to roofs falling in, but they don't tend to lead to thick masonry walls falling down. So that's not a particularly good fit with Mark's one stone will not be left on another. Actually, his prediction has not come true even today, assuming that is that you accept the conventional view of where the temple was located, which is contested, and also assuming that Jesus was referring to the whole area rather than just the temple. It hasn't come true because part of the western retaining wall of the Temple Mount still stands. Compare this situation with the Gospel of Matthew. The chapter in question is Matthew 24, and much of it was copied virtually verbatim from Mark 13, but it follows immediately after the end of Matthew 23, which has this to say, speaking of teachers of the law and Pharisees. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation." Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The reference to their house being left desolate seems to be looking back to the destruction, and there are a couple of other similar passages in both Matthew and Luke which also appear to be looking back to the events surrounding the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But these are missing from Mark. And of course, temple destructions were not new to either Jewish prophecy or to Jewish history, and it is possible that Mark got the idea from somewhere else prior to 70 and got lucky. These problems with the post-70 AD dating of Mark have led some scholars to concede a date range that starts earlier, generally from the mid to late 60s, when the Judeo-Roman War was already underway, hence wars and rumours of wars, and, they argue, the ultimate destruction of the temple could be more reliably predicted. Maybe, but it would still be a lot harder than predicting it after the fact, and rumours of wars is hardly specific. If the 70 AD argument is watered down this way, I consider it no longer strong enough to displace the early Christian dating. So personally I feel the issue dichotomises into the 40s AD or the early 70s, rather than there being a significant possibility of Mark dating from the 60s. Now these dates are not discussed in isolation, but rather each school fits their dating into their narrative explanation of the origin of the Jesus story. We've already seen the apologetic narrative that simply follows the Church Fathers. The secular historicist position generally dates Mark to the early 70s and relates the timing of the appearance of Mark to the dates of Jesus' life, usually citing one or both of two reasons. Those are that Mark appeared when it did out of necessity, because had the author waited any longer, there would not have been any eyewitness accounts available. Jesus' generation and his disciples in particular were already dying off. The other reason is that it appears that the very early church believed that the return of Jesus would be imminent. Mark and all of the synoptic gospels mention two prophecies which imply that the return will be within the lifetime of Jesus' hearers and therefore perhaps the early church did not feel the need to witness for posterity. But as those who had listened to Jesus died off, early Christians had to revise the time frame of their eschatology, and the need for witnessing to posterity arose. These two mechanisms differ, but both anchor the timing of Mark to within one human lifespan of the dates of a historical Jesus. On the mythicist side, there is no corresponding automatic time frame from which to develop the narrative, because there was no earthly life of Jesus. This does not make it necessary to replace the early life of Jesus with other historical events that got the ball rolling, because if it was going to happen, it had to happen sometime, whether or not we're able to discern why it was at this time and not that time. But nevertheless, the argument is strengthened if there is a clear historical event that triggered the production of the Gospels, and in particular of Mark. Insofar as the mythicist campus develops such a time frame narrative, 
the event that it turns on is the 66 to 70 AD Judeo-Roman War, which involved the destruction of the Jewish Temple in 70. That obviously produced a major social and religious upheaval, quite enough to provoke some religious rethinking. However, there is one thing to be careful of, and that is that I've noticed when this argument is put, mythicists often place a Christian rather than a Jewish spin on Jewish belief. A simplified version of the argument is that salvation in Judaism was at the time totally dependent on atonement for sin achieved through animal sacrifice in the temple. And that following the temple's destruction, this route to salvation, the only one available, was permanently curtailed, and therefore there was a desperate and urgent need for an alternative. Ergo, a freehold purchase rather than an annual rental scheme. And what will be the price of such a purchase? And the rest follows. That's very neat, but this scheme assumes a theology of original sin. That is, sin that you are unable to avoid committing, and for which you are incapable of atoning, and have therefore to depend on some form of vicarious atonement. If the standard means of vicarious atonement is annual animal sacrifice at the temple, its curtailment brings a serious spiritual crisis. The problem is that Jews do not and did not subscribe to this theology at all. Animal sacrifice was not the only means of being right with God. It was actually a minor part of the scheme of Jewish religion. And curtailment of animal sacrifice did not plunge the entire Jewish nation into certain damnation. Therefore, while the outline of a scheme and timing of the gospel narratives in relation to the Judeo-Roman war is quite feasible, it's not quite as neat as some would have us believe, and notice that this scenario involves, as is often the case, quite a bit of speculation. Maybe there was a group to whom this was a significant religious upheaval who responded with Christianity. We don't know anything about that specific group, but maybe. Now, to show how easy it is to create this kind of speculative scheme... I'm going to come up with one of my own. I'm not promoting it as a possibility. I'm simply showing how readily a narrative structure can be fitted around facts that are sparse. So suppose the timing of the appearance of the Gospel was related to the death of a generation of historical figures, and that generation was the pillars of the Church, or Peter and Paul and their contemporaries, and that the reason that the Gospels only appeared after the death of that cohort is because the Gospel writers did not agree with the pillars and seized the opportunity when their opponents were out of the way. Their disagreement with the pillars may have been either because they, the Gospel writers, conflated a historical preacher with the God about whom he preached, or else they concocted an incarnation narrative to fulfil a particular theological purpose, that being to lock down doctrine. A problem there is, of course, that the traditional way of locking down doctrine was for God to send a prophet, not to turn up himself. So to sum up, the authorship and the date of the Gospel of Mark is attested by more witnesses who were closer in time to the writing of the Gospel than virtually any other ancient work. These witnesses were the Church Fathers, and they have John Mark, companion of the disciple Peter, writing Mark in the 40s AD. But the fathers were not all independent of each other. The story may have originated with just one of them, Papias. Furthermore, there's a strong suspicion that what Papias was talking about were works other than the Gospel of Mark that we now have, and that Papias' comments were confused with our Mark later. And lastly, the church fathers were pursuing an evangelical agenda, rather than attempting to be objective historians like Herodotus. For these reasons, most secular scholars reject them. This leaves us with the This Generation text, which sits comfortably in the 40s and is feasible but somewhat strained in the 70s and seriously strained thereafter. Finally, there is the destruction of the temple, which is a strong steer to a post-70 date, with some reservations because Mark's description isn't quite what we learn from Josephus. However, trying to compromise and allow a date of writing in the 60s draws the argument's teeth, to the extent that, to my mind at least, we default to the 40s rather than the 60s. So, weigh the evidence carefully and reach your conclusion. Well, the problem with that is you probably won't reach a firm conclusion, so I suggest that you start by deciding what it is that you want to believe, then you trawl through the sources seeking evidence to support your view. After all, that's what everybody else does.